Lynn Riley met her husband when she was 14 years old. They dated for a short stint during her teenage years, broke up, but got back together again in her 20s. That's when the abuse started. It was everything, verbal, physical, mental, even uh, like torture. Sometimes would not let me out, would hold me against my will if I tried to leave. Ditches, broken bones. We were living in a shelter and the night before we were supposed to go to a meeting for the shelter, we got into a physical altercation. And when I walked into that meeting, I got asked, will your husband be joining us? And I didn't know for certain, so I just said yes. And she said, okay, well, you know, we'll give him a few minutes. But in the meantime, let me ask you, you know, a few questions. Where do you see yourself in five years? And unknown to her or anyone else, I didn't even know. I was just trying to stay alive for the next five minutes. So five years was, like, overwhelming. And I had... Uh, like an emotional, mental breakdown. And they had to take me to the hospital. And from there was how I started getting away. The common question to stories of domestic violence is, why didn't they just leave? But Riley says it's much more complicated than just packing up and getting out. For some, it may mean finding a new house, new job, filing an order of protection, shifting your kids to relatives for the short term, asking for outside help. The list goes on. In every scenario, it's leaving the partner you once loved and breaking apart a life you've built. How many times I did stay, how many times I did take them back. It's one of those situations that if you've never been in it, it's hard to understand. For Riley, leaving her husband meant moving in with her father and then eventually leaving the state. Despite numerous protection orders against her ex, he would track her down across state lines, threaten her, get arrested, be released, and from there the cycle would continue over and over again. I don't think anyone understood how bad it was or how hard it was. So the last two, three years, it was safer and better for me to try and be friends. We kept light communication, and he was trying to move on with his life, but... Back in October of last year, he murdered his new partner. So while Riley survived, another woman didn't. She says the system dropped the ball. After years of violence and arrests, why did it take a woman dying to connect the dots and put her ex behind bars for good? Over half of the women murdered each year are victims of intimate partner violence, says the CDC. And homicides related to these incidents are rising. Between 2014 and 2017, the number of victims killed by intimate partners rose by nearly 20 percent, according to a recent study by Northeastern University. But those statistics don't help us understand what exactly drives perpetrators to commit these crimes. Domestic violence is, in some ways, the nature of it is psychological. People sort of conflate domestic violence and anger management as if they're the same thing, but they're really not. And Perpetrators of domestic violence are not necessarily rageaholics or any kind of person that we would recognize on the street. They're sort of hiding in plain sight. That's Rachel Louise Snyder, a journalist and author of No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Domestic Violence Can Kill Us. She says abusive partners can come from any background, class, and race. Oftentimes, there are markers such as substance abuse and growing up in a violent home, personality characteristics showing egocentric, aggressive behavior, like extreme possessiveness and overreaction, are also common. In her book, Snyder speaks with one woman who suffered through psychological and emotional abuse, which can sometimes be more damaging than the physical abuse itself. There's a woman named Michelle who really didn't have very many signs of physical abuse. Her family never saw anything. His family never saw anything. But he would do things like, if he was upset with her, he would take the kids to a hotel for a night or camping for a night, and she wouldn't know where they were, and she'd be frantic with worry. Or he, at one point, he went to the outskirts of the city where they lived in Montana and got a rattlesnake and brought it home and kept it in a cage and said, you know, I'm going to put this in bed with you if you do anything. 
Once a victim does finally leave, the year following the separation can be the most dangerous. An unstable transitional period, coupled with a controlling partner often seeking retaliation. However, instead of seeing themselves as survivors, many victims blame themselves, feel embarrassed, and are reluctant to seek out help. There's so much shame, right? There's this idea that if you are the victim of domestic violence, you've made a bad decision. So we put the impetus on the victims, whether they're men or women, for choosing poorly or for staying in these relationships, when in fact it's our inability to understand the complexity. The national nonprofit My Sister's House was founded in 2000 and aims to raise awareness and help survivors of domestic violence. The organization provides women with shelter, counseling, work opportunities, legal help, weekly support groups, a 24-hour support line, and much more. Riley says many of the volunteers at my sister's house are survivors and know what it's like firsthand. For me, being that I am now in a better, healthier place mentally and physically, and I just felt it's important to give back. Despite an increase in the number of similar resources and organizations, Snyder says the legal system has been slow to catch on. In the U.S., for example, we didn't even have laws against spousal abuse until 1984, like 20 years after the civil rights movement, right? So in some ways, it's a conversation that is in its infancy in the U.S. I think to me, this is a long overdue discussion. The Violence Against Women Act, signed into law in 1994, tries to protect victims of domestic abuse by providing federal grants to a variety of initiatives. Since its creation, more than $7 billion has been allocated to shelters, community programs, training for law enforcement, and studies focused on gender-based violence. Every few years, the bill needs to be renewed, and this year it's up again with updated provisions to expand law enforcement's right to strip abusers of firearms. New research shows that since 2010, gun-related murders tied to domestic violence have spiked by 26%. The bill passed through the House in April, but is still awaiting the Senate. Many conservative political groups, including the National Rifle Association, are opposing the measure, citing the Second Amendment. I think that women are angry, and I think we are unabashedly angry about this, and I think that's going to spur change. Victims like Riley say local law enforcement and the legal system need to stop labeling this kind of violence as a domestic dispute or a public disturbance where offenders get a slap on the wrist and a few days in jail. There must be a system in place connecting the patterns of repeat offenders, leading to more stringent punishment. And this action needs to come from the top. I don't think that it is masculinity writ large that is the problem. I think it is a certain type of mindset and a certain type of man who is being given this sort of model behavior by the person who holds the highest office. And in some sense, I don't want to lay everything at the feet of the Trump administration, but there is this real disregard for women's issues, for equality, for Anybody who is other, anybody who is not heteronormative. Pamela Sykes is another survivor of domestic violence and believes we need to make a cultural change as a society for things to start getting better. So people and men understand that masculinity has nothing to do with control. Masculinity has nothing to do with abuse. Until they change the way that they view women, they'll never understand that. These women are equal. These women are their partners. It's also up to both mothers and fathers to educate kids early on in order to break the cycle of abuse. Women that have young boys have to teach them the value of women. And until we have that discussion with the generation that have children that says, hey, listen, mommy has had to experience this. I'm teaching my sons differently. To learn more about domestic violence and how you can help, visit the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence website at ncadv.org. Find more links and resources related to this story at viewpointsonline.net. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Viewpoints Radio 
And subscribe and listen to our show anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Our writer-producer for this segment is Amira Zaveri. I'm Gary Price. How much do you know about migraine? June is National Migraine and Headache Awareness Month, so it's a great time to start learning. You probably know that migraine can be disabling and marked by severe head pain. But did you know that migraine is the third most prevalent illness in the world? In the U.S. alone, millions of people are affected by migraine. And did you know that one in three patients with migraine avoid planning activities because they fear a migraine attack will force them to cancel? Are you losing precious moments to migraine? What if you could find more moments with less migraine? A Jovi Fremenizumab VFRM injection is a prescription medicine for the preventive treatment of migraine in adults that reduces monthly migraine days and for some, cuts their migraine days by 50% or more. A Jovi is the only preventive treatment for migraine that can be taken quarterly as three 225-milligram injections or monthly as one 225-milligram injection. Do not use if you are allergic to a Jovi or its ingredients. A Jovi may cause allergic reactions such as itching, rash, hives, swelling of face, mouth, tongue, or throat, or trouble breathing hours to one month after use. Get medical help right away if you have swelling or trouble breathing. Common side effects of Ajovi include injection site reactions. For more information about Ajovi, including the full prescribing information, talk to your doctor. Call 800-887-8100. Or visit ajovi.com. Family members are typically the first to notice memory issues or cognitive problems in a loved one, but they're often hesitant to say something. A new survey released by the Alzheimer's Association, however, reveals that nearly 9 in 10 Americans would want others to tell them if they themselves were showing signs of memory loss, thinking problems, or other symptoms of cognitive decline. This month during Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month, the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council are launching a new campaign urging people to notice the signs and start a conversation. Ruth Drew is Director of Information and Support Services for the Alzheimer's Association. Alzheimer's disease is challenging, but talking about it doesn't have to be. We say follow the ABCs, assess changes, begin a conversation, and contact the Alzheimer's Association for help. For information on the campaign and resources to begin this important conversation, visit alz.org slash our stories. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Viewpoints is a production of MediaTracks Communications. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook to learn about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on iTunes. Plus, you'll always find podcasts of our segments and information about our guests at viewpointsonline.net. Join us again next week for your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Viewpoints.